Hey, welcome to the Stone Report. Oh, looks like we've had a little bit of a camera adjustment go on. All right, looks like the sound is good. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Stoner Report. It's November 29th, 2013. Um, Maria Stoner, associate editor of Vancouver, uh, sorry, <laughs> associate editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine. I'm broadcasting from Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the last weekend of the Sensible BC campaign. We will have um, until the 5th to collect enough signatures. So if you're in British Columbia uh, and you're a registered voter and you haven't signed yet, uh, please do that. Um, I think that we're pretty close. It's really hard to say. Uh, regardless of whether we make it this time or not, um, Dane Larson says we're going to try again next year uh, before the next election. So... Um, we'll have like uh, many people uh, trained and ready and uh, in case we don't make it this time uh, we'll definitely do it next time but uh, we still have a few more days so there's a lot of signatures out there that uh, probably haven't come in yet um, so uh, yeah get out there sign it uh, don't forget to bring in your signatures if you're a canvasser uh, so it's been an interesting week in the Cannabis news, as usual. Um, some science news to start off with. It turns out that ibuprofen can kill the pot buzz, research reveals. Um, how is everybody in chat? Hey, Valley Boy, how's it going there? Got, let's see, how many viewers? 13 viewers. How's it going? Nice to see you all. Hope you enjoy the show. Ibuprofen is great for squashing a headache. Turns out the pain medication can also block a marijuana high, which can be either a bummer or a benefit depending on your perspective. According to a new study performed by mice, on mice by researchers at the Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center and published in the Cell Journal, chemicals in the over-the-counter painkiller allow the plant's therapeutic benefits to kick in with no buzz, no memory loss, and no loss of motivation. The findings could help provide a way for patients who use marijuana to combat pain, but who don't like to get stoned, find relief. And they could expand other legal treatment options for people suffering from chronic diseases. Our studies have solved the long-time mystery of how marijuana causes neuronal and memory impairments, one of the study's authors said in a statement. The results suggest that the use of medical marijuana could be broadened if patients concurrently take a non-steroidal anti inflammatory drug such as ibuprofen. Okay, well they found that uh, that uh, helps with memory loss and destroys the high. Well, it says it can, so it's really hard to say whether it does so with everyone, and really the study was done on mice. So I've never heard of anybody saying that taking an ibu ibuprofen will uh, eliminate their high, but uh, I suppose that's something that can be studied next. It would be nice to, uh, you know, sometimes uh, lose that temporary uh, short-term memory loss, and if that's a way to do it, that would be nice, though I can see a dark side to it <laughs> of people being forced to take ibuprofen so that they don't get high, and, uh, well, we'll see. All right, next on our list, uh, the world's first marijuana retail license was issued in Colorado last week. The world's first ever retail license has been issued in Central City, Colorado this week, according to the Marijuana Policy Project. The recipient of the license, Annie's, or Annie Oakley's, as uh, the picture says, a dispensary operating as a medical marijuana center is yet to receive its state license. Nonetheless, businesses in localities across Colorado are scheduled to begin selling pot to adults beginning January 1, 2014. MMP's Mason Vert, who co-directed the successful campaign, welcomed the historic move. Colorado is moving forward and leaving marijuana prohibition behind. For the first time in history, those who sell marijuana are receiving licenses from the state instead of rap sheets. Marijuana will be sold to adults by legitimate tax-paying businesses instead of drug cartels in the underground market, he said in a statement. So there we go. That's, uh, things are coming along in Colorado. We're going to see what happens come uh, the first. 
you remember last week, uh, Health Canada sent out many letters uh, outing medical marijuana patients in Canada by having the medical marijuana program own the envelope, and that has caused at least one person to sue Health Canada. Thousands of Canadians across the country are planning a class action lawsuit against Health Canada after they were outed as medical marijuana users in a mass mail out last week. Cannabis in Canada Society founder and director Jason Wilcox, who has been a guest on Jeremiah's show often, told Metro that at least one person has lost their job over the gaffe and thousands more fear their gardens may be targeted and their houses robbed. The fear is the result of Health Canada sending out 40,000 documents to patients in a white envelope with the words Medical Marijuana Access Program written across the top, followed by the patient's name and address. We want the government to see the potential fallout, said Wilcox, adding that he worries for patients who live in small towns, especially those who reside in right-wing conservative town that is anti-marijuana. If you're in a small town, you're more exposed, and it goes into the neighbor's mailbox, which often happens with Health Canada, you're exposed, and everybody, everybody that's in a small town talks. I'm just going to fix that camera a bit more. Just a little bit. There we go. So yeah, there's uh, another story of somebody uh, suing Health Canada. So I'll read that one as well. Medical marijuana privacy concerns spark legal action. A law firm in Halifax that is representing medical marijuana users has filed a class action lawsuit against the federal government, arguing that Health Canada outed them and violated their privacy. Health Canada sent letters to about 40,000 people across the country to inform them of changes to the medical marijuana access program beginning April 1st. The envelopes referred explicitly to the marijuana program included the users' names and addresses. Less than a week ago, some complaints came forward arguing that that violates their privacy. The McKinnis Copper Law Firm filed the class action in federal court on Monday. It must be certified by a judge to proceed, and none of the allegations have been proven in court. Well, I don't think that it's going to be very difficult to prove that the letters were sent out. So many people have uh, received them. Uh, we have a picture of one of them uh, from the CBC on our front page. So uh, we'll see what happens. I hope, uh, <laughs> you know, it seems to me and, and a lot of other people that this was done intentionally um, just to scare people. And uh, if so, they're definitely going to have fallout from that action. And even if not, they're going to have fallout for being such idiots. But I don't think they're that stupid. It's really hard to say. Evil or stupid, you be the judge. Here's a nice article. 11 ways a drug warrior raises your taxes and shrinks your profits. One public policy with profound impacts on business and economy is, the rarely, is rarely evaluated. Drug prohibition policy. Over the past five years... We have witnessed profound changes in the U.S. and global economies. Who would, who would have ever imagined that General Motors would go into bankruptcy and the government would take a one-third stake in its ownership? U.S. unemployment has been extraordinarily high. Key sectors of the economy, such as housing, have been knocked to the ground. Federal government indebtedness has skyrocketed. State and local government spending has cratered, resulting in extensive cuts in service from public schools to police departments. Every business knows that, just, that its survival could be upended by a shock to oil prices and the unavailability of credit or a hit to the economy of Europe or China. Every investor is desperate to protect their portfolio against loss and struggles to obtain a return on investment greater than inflation. The economic impact of public policy dominates every contest, from county sheriff to pe president, from U.S. senator to town councillor. Yet one public policy with profound impacts on business and the economy is rarely evaluated, drug prohibition policy. Around the world, government leaders, ordinary citizens, and business leaders are now questioning the effectiveness, the merit, and the wisdom of continuing the war on drugs. If you are an out-of-work carpenter or automaker, or you once had a job making anything in the U.S., part of why you are unemployed or underemployed is the war on drugs. 
All of the additional costs to businesses in lost sales translate into fewer jobs for people who make the things to sell. All the additional costs of added insurance or security or losses due to shoplifting or other crime means less money to spend on salary or advertising to build market share and to keep a company you work for growing, giving you the possibility of a raise or a shot at a promotion. So there's, there's a, a good indication um, that uh, the drug war is just hurting us in all, all ways of our life. Um, if, uh, if people don't get paid enough, they can't reinvest into the economy and all the businesses will suffer. And that's just, and that's just one of the, the ways uh, the war on drugs seems to be uh, uh, hurting businesses. So, not to mention the people who are drug tested or uh, live extremely tense lives because they can't uh, relax in their set way or have to use alcohol or whatever, some sort of legal intoxicant. Um, so, yeah, it's good to it's good that uh, this story came out uh, from Alternet. So, thanks Alternet. I get a lot of stuff from there. Another. Uh, Kind of financial story here. Will legal pot hurt the booze business? What do you think? With marijuana law reform sweeping the nation, will consumers be driven to drink more or less alcohol? As the legalization of recreational ma marijuana gains momentum across the United States with public support at an all-time high, many advocates eagerly, eagerly await to see what effect legalization will have on big alcohol. Will it be forced to fight for market share? Or is alcohol so heavily ingrained in our society that pot legalization will barely create a ripple with booze consumption remaining unaffected? In the cannabis reform movement, it is an article of faith that the more pot is legally set accessible, the less booze will be consumed. But, but is there evidence to support that theory? The answer to the overall question likely depends on how cannabis and alcohol interact in our culture. That is, whether par pot will complement booze and vice versa, or whether people will choose pot as an alternative to drinking. As Forbes explains, if the two substances are complements, then states legalizing marijuana would expect to see more consumption on both sides, which may increase competition and likely exacerbate pre-existing health concerns over, about overconsumption of alcohol, particularly in this area of mixing Red Bull and other highly caffeinated drinks with booze. However, if pot truly becomes a substitute for alcohol, then legalizing marijuana may reduce alcohol consumption. According to economists D. Mark Anderson and Daniel Rees, co-authors of the, of the most recent research of the topic published in the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management, men, marijuana and alcohol are substitutes rather than complementary substances. The co-authors co co cite a number of prior studies ranging from 2001 to 2013, which illustrate that marijuana becomes, as marijuana becomes more readily available, adults respond by drinking less, not more, with pot legalization associated with a reduction in heavy drinking amongst 18 and 29 year olds and a 5% de decrease in beer sales. So there you go. It's definitely uh, appears to be a substitute, like lots, lots of people, uh, you know, like to do both when they party. But uh, many people that I talk to, if they're toking hard, uh, they do not want to drink. And if they're drinking, uh, they say tokes will put them to sleep or give them a headache or something like that. So um, there's also, there have been previous studies uh, that in states with medical marijuana laws uh, in effect, the drinking rates have gone down. And also traffic accidents uh, relating to alcohol have also gone down. So all in all, uh, um, you know, uh, this will, um, sorry, legalizing cannabis uh, seems to make for a healthier population um, and less alcoholism. Here's a comment piece, how President Obama should pardon both the Turkey and the drug war prisoners for the holidays. I'm sure Freddie didn't. President Obama will continue the recent Thanksgiving tradition of presidents pardoning a Turkey. I believe that happened on Thursday. 
The National Thanksgiving Turkey Presentation and a Ceremony at the White House is where the President of the United States pardons a turkey and sets it free instead of slaughtering it and making it someone's Thanksgiving dinner. As someone who has been called a turkey on more than one occasion, and who was granted executive clemency stemming from a drug convic conviction, I have found a spiritual connection to the subject of the turkey pardon. In 1985, I was arrested when I got caught up in a drug sting. I delivered four ounces of cocaine from the Bronx to Mount Vernon, New York. Twenty cops came out of nowhere, and I was placed under arrest. I did everything I could do wrong and was sentenced to 15 years to life under the Rockefeller drug laws on New York State. I was set free in 1997 after serving 12 years. I support and applaud President Obama's treatment of turkeys, but I have to ask the President, what about the treatment of more than 100,000 people who are incarcerated in the federal system because of the war on drugs? Surely some of these non-violent drug offenders deserve treatment equal to a turkey pardon. I would think so. But if you look at Obama's record on the use of executive clemency, which indicates includes pardons and commutation of sentences, you would have to say that he has be more respect for turkeys than drug war offenders. President Obama has granted only 39 pardons so far, which ranks him the bottom of the pile in presidents who have exercised this power. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty hilarious thing for uh, the guy who ran on hope and change to be, you know, one of the worst, worst presidents um, in history on drug policy. Um, it's, it's very sad what's happening in the States. It's, it just seems like the people have less and less power, and even when they do uh, appear to upset the apple cart, cart by uh, voting in uh, a Democrat, uh, the Democrats are already, like, totally corrupt. So it's just very sad. So, looks like uh, coming up on 2.20. So, I think I have time for another story before then. Uh, Monty says he has the legal right to smoke medical marijuana in uniform. A New Brunswick RCMP officer says he has a legal right to smoke medically prescribed marijuana while in uniform, despite objections from his employer. Corporal Ronald Francis, who has been on the force for more than 20 years, was recently prescribed medical marijuana to help treat his post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. He told CTV Atlantic that marijuana claim calms him down and allows him to focus on his job. Because of his PTSD, Francis has been placed on administrative duties and no longer carries a weapon. RCMP Colonel Ronald Francis says he has the legal right to smoke medical marijuana while in uniform. But Francis said the RCMP does not want him to smoke the drug while in uniform. I have the legal right and have the legal right to be in uniform because I represent members through the DSSR, Division Staff Relations Representative Program, he said. So yeah, good for him to say that. Unfortunately, uh, the RCMP uh, stripped him of his uniform. But it's 2.19, it's almost 2.20. So I'm going to light this joint and talk to the chat a bit. Hey, everyone. Is everything okay there? Uh, let's see what's going on. Old man, is something not working there? Uh, please elaborate. <laughs> I forgot to mention that... Uh, if you're in Vancouver and you want to sign the peti petition this afternoon, there's going to be oh cool, old man. There's going to be uh, people at Camby and Broadway uh, around the Whole Foods or near that area. Here we are. It's 4:20. I mean 2:20. 4:20. Happy 4:20. I hope you all have something cool to smoke out there. I do. I can't remember exactly what it is though. But it's pretty good. <coughs> okay, this time I'm actually going to go and find out which time zones I'm missing. <coughs> Who, where is it? I think it's in Colorado, but I feel... I, I'm sorry, I haven't looked it up so far, so... I promised a shout-out to some people in the city, so let's do that today. Uh... 
map here. Okay, well, it looks like it's in Canada. You guys probably know what time zone you're in. <laughs> it looks like uh, Manitoba. And uh, parts, the eastern part of Ontario is in this time zone. And in the States, let me find a nice map here. It's a little bit bigger. You guys have Central Mountain Time. Oh, there's a whole bunch of states there. And I can't get, for some reason my maps are just not zooming in properly. Oh, here we go, finally. Yeah, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. Oh yeah, there's tons of stuff. So happy 420 to all you there and happy 20 after the hour to everybody else. Wasn't that exciting? Okay, back to the news. A veteran RCMP officer was stripped of his uniform and chastised by the Federal Justice Minister Thursday after he was filmed smoking medical marijuana in what he said was a bid to raise awareness about post-traumatic stress disorder in the RCMP. Justice Minister Peter McKay condemned New Brunswick Corporal Ron Francis, saying the display sets a poor example for Canadians. My observation is the same for... Po as for politicians, police, they fall in a similar category in the sense that it sets a very poor example to flout the law, he said. But Corporal Francis was not accused of breaking the law. He smoked legally prescribed joint in front of a video camera while wearing his red serge. Well, that's quite disgusting. The RCMP uh, higher-ups have been... Uh, always against uh, uh, repealing prohibition, and they constantly uh, are opposed to any legalization efforts. Um, this is just an example of them um, over overstepping their authority, in my opinion. I mean, uh, the guy did not break the law. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm sure, is an extremely big issue among police officers. Um, and the fact that the justice minister went out and said uh, that uh, he was flouting the law, well, how do you flout a law if you don't break it? He didn't do anything wrong. So that's, that's pretty disgusting to hear and feel bad for Corporal Francis. And uh, all the best to him and good for you for trying to speak out. We're nearing the end. Excuse me. End of the show now, and uh, like other shows, I'm going to try to do a couple of uh, hemp stories. With legal weed comes hemp beer. Marijuana's legalization in Colorado and Washington had led, has led to a boom market of growers, sellers, and investors seeking to cash in as the long illicit drug goes legit. And then there's the ancillary market. Cannabis swag has been flourishing in each state with the leaf appearing on everything from throw pillows to key fobs. So it should come as a little surprise that breweries are riding the green wave. As Washington processes the first applications for pot-related businesses and licenses, local store shelves are being stocked with 22-ounce bottles of Joint Effort, a hemp beer crafted by two local breweries to evoke the aroma of weed. The name is a double entendre about their collaboration and the drug that was legalized there last November. It's also part of the reason that the brew can be sold only in the Evergreen State. Beer brewed with hemp, a botanical cousin to hops, can be and has been sold elsewhere in the U.S., so long as it tests negative for mind-altering THC. But a hemp brew's label can, can, can't contain any slang or graphics implying or referencing the presence of marijuana if it's going to be approved by the federal government for sales across state lines. Joint effort made by Red Hook Ale Brewery and Hillard's, Hilliard's Beer, is decorated with the tagline, A Dubious Collection Between Two Buds. And those puns, a company spokesman says, were enough for the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau to reject their label application. That left the brewers to sell their resiny ale at home, where the State Liquor Board approved. 
Oh, that one was from Time Magazine. Um, yeah, I don't, I haven't had hemp beer for a while. I'll have to give it a shot. It's, uh, too bad that it's only available in the one state there. And in Kentucky, Kentucky officials again approach the DEA, DEA on the hemp issue. And as you all know, hemp contains such minuscule amounts of THC that it can't get anybody high. Persistent Kentucky officials have again approached the U.S. Department, the U.S. Drug Enforcement, Enforcement Administration about growing industrial hemp in the state. This time they've sent a letter to the DEA asking the agency to clarify its position on industrial hemp. Agricultural Commissioner James Comer, U.S. Senator Rand Paul, and U.S. Reps John Yarmuth and Thomas Massey want the DEA to specifically address whether growing hemp remains illegal in states like Kentucky that have enacted a framework for licensing and regulating the crop. So yeah, it's, the DEA is still being completely ridiculous and not being clear, and uh, it's good that uh, people in Kentucky and other states are pushing forward regardless. Okay, so that's the news for this week. Um, thank you everybody for watching. Um, yeah, remember in BC, if you're, uh, if you're in BC and you haven't signed the Sensible BC petition yet, please do so. We need as many signatures as we can get in our final stretch. It's only until December 5th, so this will be my last show before it's over. I'm going to be canvassing this weekend, uh, in the, uh, probably in the same area that I'm sending people to now, which is going to be Broadway and Canby. There's a team there right now. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks everybody who's uh, doing all they can to help legalize marijuana. Uh, shout out to everybody in Amsterdam. Uh, I think the cup's ending or has ended and uh, looking forward to seeing you all come back and hearing all your stories. And uh, don't forget, uh, cannabis is the most advanced plant on the planet. We can utilize it to help save ourselves and save the planet. So peace. Uh, take care, and I'll see you next week.